wanted to start by giving people an overview of why psilocybin assisted therapy is a good fit for really a broad range of mental health challenges. And what I, where I wanted to start at is if you could give people, remember you explained this to me once, like just how psychologists in like psychology 101 kind of categorize people in terms of neurotic functioning, borderline and psychotic and like how, how the, how, yeah, just like how mental health conditions are characterized from that, from that point of view. Absolutely, man. Well, essentially psychologists always love frameworks and we've got two ways that we think about people. And what's great about psychedelics is they help people develop themselves in both ways. So one way you can think about people is with regards to quote unquote, their symptomology. So these are your emotional experiences. These are your behavioral patterns. And usually these are sources of suffering in your life. These would be your symptoms. Mm -hmm. This is where we would class things like post-traumatic stress, depression, addiction, trauma. So we'd say these are behavioral patterns and symptoms in your life that we could target and we can try and change to help you. Another way of thinking about people is at a personality level. What are the enduring ways that you think about yourself, the world, and other people that creates the lens through which you view your everyday life? And when you look at personality, there are two dimensions to a person's personality. So the first dimension is what we call psychic organization. And there are three layers, the ones you mentioned. You get neurotic, borderline, and psychotic. So the way I like to think about it is you can think of your psychic organization as what your house is built out of. If you're neurotic, your house is built out of bricks. It would take a lot to get you to decompensate. It would take a lot for me to blow your house down. So people who are neurotically functioning usually have a really strong sense of identity. You have a good sense of yourself. You're very reflective. You do a lot of your internal work. You also have very mature coping mechanisms. So you're incredibly resilient. You can intellectualize, compartmentalize, you can repress things, you find structured solutions to problems. So you've got a whole range of ways that you deal with stuff and you've got really good reality contact. You're excellent at telling the difference between what you think and the way something is actually working. You have a good grasp of consensus reality is the, is the way of putting oh, it. Right. Yeah. And, um, and just, just, I just want to, um, the word neurotic has a lot of negative connotations. So it's not normal. You wouldn't normally describe like healthy functioning people as being neurotic. Where does that come from? So it's actually because we, we have a, a typical psychologist problem. So very many people criticize psychology when they say it's not really scientific. And that's not because we don't use scientific methods. We actually use really sophisticated scientific methods. Where psychology gets flack is that we lack something that Gad Sad calls consilience. So consilience is a tendency for different uh, theorists to work from the same theory. So in medicine, everybody works off a pretty similar idea of what the theory of this problem is. In engineering, we all think a certain way. In physics, we all think a certain way. In psychology, we don't really do that. In psychology, we've got 401 different theories on how we can operate with people. So they're vastly different. So because of that, we start using the same word with different meanings. So in the personality model that I'm busy describing, I'm speaking more psychoanalytically. So mm. to call someone neurotic when you speak psychoanalytically is the best compliment you can give them. It's actually a really good thing. Um, and I often have to qualify that with people I'm working with, where I'm like, I'm going to use this word and I promise you I actually mean it in a good way. So okay. psychoanalysts will say neurotic is good, but there's another model that we use for personality, often known as the big five, which many people are familiar mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And in that model, neurotic means lots of negative emotion. Like tendency towards crazy. negative emotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So because we've got these two different models coming from two different theories in the same field, there's a lot of misunderstanding as to where they, where, where they meet. Okay, got it. So, so let's go back. So you were saying you have the, the three personality types is neurotic functioning, and then the next? So the next one is borderline. So borderline would mean that you have an unstable self-concept. It means that you don't have a very clear sense of yourself, what you truly want, what you truly think, and sometimes you struggle to reflect on yourself. It also means that you don't have particularly well-developed coping mechanisms. So mm -hmm. it means that sometimes you'll react in extreme ways and use somewhat unsophisticated ways of dealing with things when you're stressed. So whereas a neurotic person 
might be able to compartmentalize something or repress it for the time being, hold it down. Someone who's borderline won't be able to tolerate the emotion and might act out immediately on it as a way of coping with it. And finally, someone who's borderline, someone has tenuous reality contact. Mm. So what that means is that when they're calm, they have a great understanding of consensus reality. When they're upset, they struggle to tell the difference between what they think and what reality is. So a good example of this is for a neurotically functioning person, if I say something that bothers them, maybe offends them, a neurotically functioning person is perfectly capable of going, okay, Anthony said that and I interpret it this way, but that might just be my thought. He might've meant something different. Let me check. Mm. When someone's upset and they're borderline, what they think is what you said. So they're not open to the idea that the reality was different, which complicates that. Yeah. Yeah. So some, and, someone, someone who's borderline, their house is made of wood. Okay. Got it. And the final category? So the final category is psychotic. So psychotic means that you don't really have a self-structure. It means that you don't really have any coping mechanisms and you've got really poor reality contact. That's why you'll often see someone who's psychotic struggles with delusions and hallucinations. They can't tell the difference between the internal world and the external world. And so your house is made out of straw. For the neurotic person, you're almost unshakable. It takes a lot of trauma to get you to break down. For the person who's borderline, it doesn't take that much to get you to break down. For the psychotic person, it's remarkably easy. The slightest thing can break you completely. And so you see these three layers occurring. And that that's what you might call the vertical dimension of personality. It's it's what your house is built from, how sturdy the material is. And then there's a second dimension. The second dimension you can almost think of as your horizontal dimension. And that dimension is your character structure. The way I think of it is that's how you decorate your house. And that's where we find the terms we're often familiar with. So that's where you'll hear the words narcissistic, obsessive compulsive, masochistic, psychopathic, histrionic or hysterical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these colorful ways in which you can decorate your house that tell you a little bit about the distinct qualities of that person. That's a beautiful like illustration of thinking about it from a structural point of view. So it's like the three categories that you outlined really are kind of foundational and within those three foundational structures, there's an infinite like array of ways you can present yourself in the world. And that's why all human beings are different. But typically, that's how you categorize people at the highest kind of level. And so I watched this really um, uh, awesome interview with, uh, it was with Rich Roll and Tim Ferriss, where Far I think I shared it with you. And um, Ferris was talking about how and we're, now we're getting into psilocybin therapy and psychedelic therapy in general, right? So he had said that basically uh, mental health challenges, let's call them this, are characterized on either end of a continuum, on, on an extreme continuum. You have conditions that are characterized by extreme openness, and you have conditions that are characterized by extreme rigidity, right? Mm -hmm. So how does, and, and essentially what he was saying is that psychedelic therapy is very good for conditions that are uh, that, that are extremely rigid and very bad for conditions that are very open. So does this really refer to the structure of the house that you were talking about or the decorations or both? It's, it's such a fantastic um, analogy. It's a beautiful image and it refers to the structure. So it's precisely what he's describing. So we all know that with the exception of a little bit of research being done, the general consensus, at least at the moment, is that psychedelics aren't helpful to people who are psychotic. They would fall in the highly open range. Mm -hmm. There is no self-structure. There are no defenses. There are no thinking patterns. It's far too open. Psychedelics don't assist them. But then when you get to the other end of the spectrum, neurotic, as we said, everything's made of bricks. It's strong. It's rigid. It's stable. It's inflexible psychedelics work magic in this instance. Another way of thinking about it um, that, that I've sometimes liked is, is if you were to think of people as pots of boiling water, um, you get some people who their problem is they're a pot of boiling water and when the water gets really hot, i.e. they get stressed, the water just spills over because they don't have a lid. They've got no way of containing this emotional experience. That would refer more to people in the psychotic and the borderline range. But then you get a class of people who, if they're a pot of boiling water, their problem isn't that the water spills over. Mm. It's that the lid is on so tight that mm. not even steam can get out. 
And so they're caught in this high rigidity where the pressure builds and builds and builds and their patterns get stronger and stronger and stronger and there's no relief. And so they don't need a lid to be built and put on. They need something that can loosen that lid temporarily to create a little bit of relief and allow them to adopt new patterns and ways of structures of doing things. That is another excellent way of understanding this. Um, so then moving on from that analogy, why is psilocybin such an effective tool at um, helping with poking holes in that lid or opening the lid a little bit? Well, that's where the beauty of it comes in because when you think of something like a neurotic personality, we're saying to you that your great strength is that you're incredibly resilient against stress and you're pretty capable of getting through almost anything. But what you're going to struggle with is becoming highly flexible in different situations. Now, when you've got a personality who's neurotic, you're really, really strong and stable. And usually accompanying that are certain character traits. So when we talk about how you decorate your house, for example, you might get someone who is obsessive compulsive in their personality, which is a little bit different from OCD. So to be obsessive compulsive in your personality means that you are highly intellectual, you tend to create a lot of structure and order and routine, you're extremely conscientious. It also means that you're incredibly agreeable with other people and you really value social harmony. But by the same token, what it often means as well is that the two most common emotions you're gonna feel are anxiety and guilt. You're constantly preoccupied, worrying about the future and how to prevent catastrophes. And you constantly feel guilty because you feel responsible to fix things for yourself and everybody else. And if you're not always in control and, and fixing everything, you feel terrible for it. The other difficulty of being obsessive compulsive is that you have a very problematic relationship to anger. Obsessive compulsive personalities really struggle with anger because they find it unacceptable to themselves. So they try never to get angry. They try never to get upset. They try never to be difficult. And while that makes them really pleasant and agreeable, it also means that they're constantly repressing and attacking themselves the whole time. Now, outwardly, this makes you highly functional. You'll often find that people who are obsessive compulsive and neurotic in organization are incredibly successful human beings. They're highly valued and prized. They have lots of great relationships, but they suffer a lot with anxiety. And the reason for this is that they don't have a mechanism by which to allow for safe, vulnerable expression of emotion, healthy means of assertiveness or channeling their anger. And so this lid is too tight because their defenses have become so strong that they can't manage things. So while they're highly effective in one direction, they're not in another. So your coping mechanisms are really great for some situations, but they're really terrible in others. And so now you've got this inflexible lid that you can't lift up. Got it. And, and, this is where uh, people go down a, a potential rabbit hole of unnecessary suffering through th with, with symptomology of addiction, depression, anxiety. It's just, and, and so, so those are the symptoms of this personality. So you're, you're built a certain way. You've got various strengths that you're built a certain way. You have various weaknesses. Our society and how we're brought up isn't very good at helping us understand our personality and how to deal with our weaknesses and our strengths because we all have them. And so we end up adopting maladaptive strategies to cope with the downsides of our personality. And the and this is why these things are kind of all linked because the root cause of them is really the same. It's just the flavor that people are choosing to deal with their suffering. Is that accurate? Spot on. That's exactly what it is. And it's why it's worth knowing that because when you understand that at a personality level, you start recognizing, okay, so I always have to fix everything for myself and everybody else, right? So that pattern, that way of coping in the world, that strategy on how to do things is a way I create control. But it comes at the expense of me getting exhausted, of me feeling resentful, and then I get depressed. And then I get depressed and then maybe I start drinking excessively. Mm -hmm. And I'm stuck in this loop that I can't get out of. But because it's become so rigidly defined in my personality, I can't seem to transcend it. And that's, and the, so habit. Yeah. that's yeah. the habit. That's the habit. I can a positive feedback loop and that's the rigidity. It's exactly that. And so this rigid thing builds up. And so from our behaviors come our symptoms. And when we try to treat the symptoms without looking at the deeper patterns, 
very often what happens is you can treat the symptom, but then the symptom gets replaced with a new symptom. It's called symptom substitution. Mm -hmm. And so we want to go deeper. And that's where psychedelics become profoundly useful. What psychedelics do is they note, they help you identify the rigid patterns in your life. They help you gain awareness of them, to see them, and they foster the ability for you to gain neuroplasticity, to make your brain more malleable, so that not only can you understand these loops, but you can actually start to change them if you wanted to, because you're finally able to see them differently. This is this is a wonderful summary, I think, and we'll and I will probably get into this in more detail. But as to why the the saying is the magic is not in the medicine, is that the medicine is there to break the pattern. Like I'm, um, you know, you're 40 years old, you've been doing the same shit over and over again for 40 years old. You can you can through various other methodologies, step outside of yourself and see these patterns. But because these neural pathways are so strong, it just takes a very long time to gain that perspective and see things from a different perspective. Whereas you take a psychedelic and, you know, even if you're not taking a psychedelic for therapeutic purposes, it's like the analogy of meditation and psychedelics. It's like you can meditate and try to get this kind of introspection, but a lot of people may just close their eyes and go, well, there's nothing to see here. And it'll take them like two years to even develop the kind of, um, or to just break the, the, the patterns or just to see things from a new perspective. But you take the right dose of a psychedelic, you will see things <laughs> entirely, <laughs> in an entirely different, different way. And that's why that's so powerful. So that gives you the perspective shift that you need. But in order to have really sustainable change, it's basically everything we've been speaking about. It's, it's, it's the therapy. It's, it's understanding how to live your life in a way that is more productive vis-a-vis -vis your circumstances and your personality. It's exactly that. And I mean, that's actually where the intrigue comes in. Because when we first started doing therapy with people back in the psychoanalytic days, they really thought that the major thing you need to give people is insight. So the whole theory was, well, if I help this person understand their patterns and the origins thereof, that will give them perspective. And if they have perspective, they'll have freedom to choose to behave differently. Now, that's true to a degree. But mm. what we start to notice is that's also very limited. So you can get those insights through therapy and you'll get them more profoundly through a psychedelic. But what almost anyone who's gone through that process will tell you is they, they, they sat there in that moment of realization and they said, wow, this is profound. I get it. Now what? Like, what do I do? Yes. And that's where that second phase of therapy has to be there. Because many people have these transcendent experiences and these magnificent insights and they feel the better for it. But they still feel lost as to what they're supposed to do because we've now shown you your pattern, but you don't know what else is out there. You've never transcended it before. And that's where the value of having a therapist comes in because you've got someone skilled being able to say to you, well, actually, based on the fact that these are your patterns, these are some new tools that we can add to your toolkit. These are new ways that we can use. And the best part about this is we're not asking you to throw away your old tools. Your old tools really work in some situations yes. and we're going to keep them there. But now we're going to give you a whole new set of tools that you can use in these other situations where they're not working. So the way I often like to, to explain it is that therapy becomes valuable because if you're a fork, we're not trying to turn you into a spoon. Therapy's goal is to turn you into a Swiss army knife, mm -hmm. but you can have all the different tools available to you and you can become a more adaptable version of yourself because the more strategies you have at hand, the better able you are at meeting your needs and the less likely you are to get stuck in those rigid loops. And so rather than taking you from these very closed rigid systems all the way to the other end of open, we're actually settling you in somewhere around the middle, which allows you to enjoy the best of both. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and it ties into the neuroplasticity of psychedelics as well, the other benefits of them. So it's the perspective shift. You get like, okay, now I get it. Then you work with some wonderful people who give you these new tools. And now that you have the tools, you're no longer as much of a prisoner to your habitual tendencies as you were before you have this period this wonderful period where it's like i've got the insight i've got the new tools and I, it's now even easier to use these tools it's like i have an unfair advantage to use these tools it's that's exactly what it i mean oh, when yeah. i started that's exactly what it felt like uh 
I think I gave this example before when after my first therapeutic psilocybin session, I was triggered by some by something where I would normally react and be angry. And it literally felt like I was in Neo from the Matrix where everything just slowed down. And it's like I could see the emotion. I could see my old behavioral pattern. And I still wanted to do it. I could, But I could see the habit. And I could see that if I had another tool in that situation, I had the choice to now use this tool. And then it, so it makes it easier to use the tool. And then by using the new tool, you then are building new neural pathways, which then turn that inst that when you get triggered next time, that starts to become a habit. The new tool becomes a habit. And so we're not relying on willpower to, 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 to practice all of these new things that are very difficult to, to habit habituate, basically. It's so well put. Um, one of my favorite concepts in psychology is actually what you're talking about, which doesn't get talked about enough when, with regards to psychedelics, but it's really important, which is this concept that Leon Festinger came up with in the 1970s. It's called cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance occurs for human beings when you're confronted with two different beliefs. So for instance, I say to you, you know, James, I grew up and my personality got shaped around this idea, for instance, that I'm only going to be love worthy insofar as I'm useful to the people around me. So this belief is sitting in my head and it's governing all of my behaviors. And then I one day go to therapy and we figure out this is the belief. This is this core belief driving something in me. And I go, great, I've got this insight. And we go, well, what now? And we'll say, well, what I've got to do now is I've got to create the perception in my mind that I can also be loved unconditionally that I don't always have to be useful. And so in order to create that new belief, I've got to behave differently. So you give me some tools. So you go, well, I want you to go spend time with people. And rather than doing things for them, I want you to try and just exist with them. And maybe even go as far as to ask them for stuff and see if they'll reciprocate with you because that might actually make you feel that way. Now, the funny thing is, you'll tell me that and it'll all sound perfectly logical. I'll agree with everything you've just said. I'll go, this is totally reasonable. And when it comes time to do it, I'm going to feel this horrid discomfort. Yeah. It's going to feel terrible, right? And that's cognitive dissonance. It's this discomfort that comes with breaking a familiar pattern. Familiar pattern, yeah. yeah. And, and that's often the hardest thing for people to overcome. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I am a very self-aware person, and yet I still do shit that is against my interest all the fucking time. And it feels like I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is, we'll get into that in a minute, but like, this is the problem, right? This is the, this well, not the, I mean, there's many problems, but this is one of the biggest challenges for people. And I suppose why we're so excited about this work is finally, there really is a highly effective, safe thing that we can take that helps with this cognitive dissonance that you just described. And that that's where, that's where I think there's something remarkable about it. Because it's exactly what you say. And I often have this conversation with people that I'm working with, because we'll go, they'll go, I know it. I go, but I feel terrible. And I said, I know. And we'll even talk about it in advance. I'm like, when I ask you to do it, you're going to know it's the right thing, but it's going to feel awful, even though you know it's right. <laughs> I want you to do it anyway. And I'm like, and that's the hard part. That's the hardest part of changing. And um, what's cool about psychedelics, as you're pointing out, is that what psychedelics do, which is amazing, is they limit that cognitive dissonance. Mm. In some cases, they almost remove it. Yes. So all of a sudden, this thing you know you need to do emotionally you're not struggling as much. You're not struggling. I mean, it's exactly, it was exactly my subjective experience that although in that example that I gave you where I got pissed off and I could feel this um, emotion of, of being pissed off, that is normally an uncomfortable emotion that I want to kind of relieve by acting out or whatever. It just didn't feel that hard not to act like an asshole. It just yeah. didn't. It was like, I see the emotion, but I'm not identified with it. I'm not suffering from it. And I don't want to be perceived as an asshole. That's more important to me than making this feeling go away. So I'm not going to behave like an asshole. And all of this took place. It's like I'm I'm explaining it. It's just so amazing how fast our brains work. Because all of this took place in a matter of you know three seconds. But like this is this is what the psychedelics do. That's why I say it's like Neo Neo in the Matrix when he slows down and he's dodging bullets. That's what it feels like as it relates to your new relationship with your emotions and your habitual tendencies. <laughs> It's precisely that. Okay, so that's that's awesome. Thanks, Dan. So I think that's a really good overview of why 
psychedelics are essentially just broadly applicable to conditions of extreme rigidity and why our programming generally and then the specific therapy with people is really good for um, symptoms of trauma depression anxiety and addiction so we're gonna so I, we, we, we want to talk about each of them specifically I think it's really useful because I think that um although a lot of these things are comorbid I think that people self-identify as kind of being one or the other and so the purpose of this is is that when people see this video and they're learning about this when we speak about their specific symptoms they'll be able to say ah this th that that this is something for me right this is something that really is tailored for me and it is